From the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, HEC-TV, Boeing, and the Danforth Center are proud to present Conversations, a discussion about conservation in nature and technology. Welcome. Well, welcome. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. It's a wonderful turnout. And I want to congratulate you on being so disciplined. For a group this size, you really move quickly into the auditorium. So we'll have plenty of time to hear, to hear our speakers. You know, I, thinking about this and seeing all the people here, many of us can hardly wait for the next episode of, concert, of Conversation Series. And this is especially interesting, and we've got a good turnout because we have two people speaking, and not just two people, but two experts, and two experts who are devoted to uh, helping preserve the environment on which, for humankind, the environment on which we all depend for everything we have, for our civilization, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it because these two people come from very different angles. And uh, <clears throat> I have no idea just what they'll say, but I'm waiting to hear. Um, I want to thank the uh, Friends Committee for hosting us, which they do for every one of these series. And we have, of the Friends Committee, we have a Conversations Committee chaired by Molly Klein and I want to thank them for arranging this program. Uh, Molly cannot be with us today, so I am filling in for her to introduce this session. Uh, the uh, <coughs> the uh, Higher Education Channel TV will be aired on Sunday, May 20th, and I think the information is on the slide so that um, you can re-listen to pick up anything you've missed. And I understand that um, the, um, uh, these programs are very, very helpful on uh, when they've been televised and very much uh, listened to. The, we, you all have, were given cards, and on one side are the bios of the panelists. And on the other side, you can write questions for the panelists, which will be uh, picked up and uh, depending on the time, there'll be an opportunity to have some of the questions answered. Uh, our moderator today is Professor Jim Davis. He's Professor of Political Science at Washington University. And uh, Jim and I have worked together since I first uh, read a paper of his, and then I talked with him and I thought, gosh, these political scientists really know something. <laughs> so Professor Jim Davis. With an introduction like that, I'm reluctant to open my mouth. <laughs> but I want to join Bill Danforth in welcoming this large crowd. I'm delighted you're here. It's a reflection both that the Plant Science Center is getting better known all the time, but a reflection, I think, also on the importance of the topic and the uh, visibility of, uh, of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, as Bill said, the bios of our conversationalists are on the question forms that were passed out to you, uh, but I'll mention just a couple of things about each. I need hardly say anything about Jim Carrington on my far right. Uh, he's president of the Donald Danforth uh, Plant Science Center. Before he came here uh, not very long ago, uh, he was at Oregon State, where he was, among other titles, a uh, distinguished professor of biology and uh, or botany and plant pathology. Um, and on my near right, I have Doug Ladd, who is conservation scientist at the uh, Nature Conservancy, and for 30 years has worked in conservation. He's trained uh, in botany. Um, and I'm delighted that you both are here. Uh, 
I suspect most of our guests tonight know something about the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, but probably somewhat fewer know a whole lot about the Nature Conservancy. So since you're a conservation scientist for Nature Conservancy in Missouri, uh, could we start off by letting me ask you in either 30 seconds or 25 words, can you tell us something about the Nature Conservancy? I'll take the 30 seconds. A little, but option. not too much, right? <laughs> yeah, the Nature Conservancy is an international, private, non governmental conservation organization dedicated <coughs> to conserving the diversity of life on Earth. Our mission is to conserve the, all the lands and waters upon which all life depends. And we seek non confrontational, collaborative solutions with a broad suite of partners to sustain the, the ecosystems that we're all dependent upon for people while meeting human, economic, and societal needs. And we're active around the globe in more than 35 countries. Now, we have to feed, the world has to feed now about 7 billion people and counting. Um, I've seen estimates of 9 billion by, by the middle of the century. Um, can we do that and sustain all those species, sustain the environment as we have it now? Um, is feeding 9 billion people compatible with conservation? Now, one answer is it has to be, but is it? I, I think that's the question upon which our well-being as a people depends, and that's what I spend a lot of my nights worrying about. As you say, 9.2 billion people by 2050, 10% um, average calorie input increase. We're going to have to double world food production, and we're going to have to do it in such a way that we still sustain the natural systems, but ultimately provide our clean water and our healthy soils and everything else. I don't have answers to that, obviously. I'm just a humble, dumb field biologist. But it seems to me we I have think, to I think you undersell field biology. I, I but where are the good old country boy? <laughs> I, I think something that I profoundly believe we're going to have to do, and why I feel honored to be here tonight in this venue, is there's a disconnect in society right now. We have this bipolar notion of the way the world works. That here's this area where nature conservation reigns supreme and it must be hands-off and sanctified. And here's this area where agricultural productivity or economic development reigns supreme. We can't think about conservation. We have to totally get rid of that if we're going to succeed as a people, I believe, and make sure we consider both in every aspect of what we as a people and we as a society do. Now, it'll be weighted differently in different places, but if we are going to succeed in meeting human food needs and resource needs and energy and fiber needs into the future, we have to be more intelligent and more sophisticated about the way we do it, and we have to do it in full cognizance that even though we think we're removed from hunter-gatherer societies living off the land, we are just as dependent on the natural systems, the plants and animals that provide our soils and water and air as our ancestors were. So I don't have answers, but I think we as a society have to better integrate those issues. But now, you said a couple of minutes ago that, uh, I'm trying to th recover your phrasing, that we seem to be divided uh, between agriculture or feeding 9.2 billion people and conservation. Uh, some potential for conflict there. And yet, as I have been thinking about it, I think of a number of examples where biotech is only is good for agriculture, but is certainly not harmful environmentally. I can tick off three or four examples. Uh, genetically modifying rice to yield a seed that can be much more salt tolerant um, developed or began to be developed because the tsunami in Japan flooded rice fields with salt water. And, the, and then I learned that about two thirds of rice paddy acreage is salty. Uh, if we have a crop that can grow in salt an environment, that seems to be a wholly a good. Uh, seed that is drought resistant seems to be wholly a good. Seed that can be productive with less fertilizer might be a big help to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I could go on, but if biotech is so positive, why did the bifurcation develop? Why are a lot of people in conservation uneasy or skeptical or hostile to biotech. 
I, again, I can't speak to the hostility part or, or the ideology. My, I guess my thesis was not that necessarily that there's always conflict, but th there's often not the dual focus there needs to be at each point. But to your point, I think absolutely, if we're going to double food production in the world, we can't double the arable ground in the world. 40% um, of the Earth's surface is already under some sort of pasture, forage, or crop production. We're going to have to be more intelligent and more intensive in the way we do agriculture for the very reasons you talk about. But at the same time, it's not all a one-edge beneficial sort. It's great if we can develop saline tolerant rice, but we also have to make sure we as a society value those saline areas that harbor irreplaceable ecosystem functions or irreplaceable aspects of our natural heritage. So not everything then is planted into saline rice and the same with drought solutions. Sure, sure. So I think we always have to think about how do we sustain the natural systems that add the vibrancy and the uniquity of place to our, our society while meeting these needs? And it's a discussion and it's a dialogue. And all too often now, one or the other reigns supreme, and they need to be integrated fully. In well, I, have, I have a question about Nature Conservancy in Missouri, but I'll, I'll come back to it in a minute. Jim, uh, let, me, let me turn the, the question a little bit. Uh, when I was uh, focused on Doug a minute ago, I mentioned several examples where I thought biotech was wholly positive uh, mm -hmm. in terms of its impact on agriculture, but with no negative environmental consequences. Are there examples you can think of where at least potentially biotech might have had a harmful effect and thus, if publicized, created skepticism about biotech? Sure. Yeah, let me, let me uh, just back up just a sure, little bit sure. and say something that I don't think you is can go forward and say something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let, let, let me make the following statement, and I would love maybe for people to challenge it. Uh, and you know, I don't know if Doug would agree or disagree. I suspect he wouldn't. Uh, but here's the statement: all of the most pressing, important issues related to agriculture and agricultural productivity, both now and particularly in the future, are essentially conservation issues. I don't distinguish conservation issues from agricultural issues at all. Now, there are some unique issues related to conservation that do not relate to agriculture, but there aren't many agricultural issues that are not at their heart conservation issues. Let me give you a couple of examples. You've already heard about a few. Water. This is something we talk about a lot. Uh, if you look at, and let me just throw out an, a specific example, in the Ogallala Aquifer, for example, that ranges from North Texas all the way up through southern South Dakota, massive paleo aquifer, meaning that it's not recharged at any appreciable rate, it's ancient water that's being drained for two primary purposes, agriculture. 30% or so of all the agriculture in the United States is, or, or of all agricultural irrigation is done with water pulled from that aquifer. It's not being recharged, so it's a limited resource. But at the same time, 80% of the households and businesses in that aquifer region draw water and depend on that aquifer. So it's a finite resource. Households depend on it. Agriculture depends on it. What are you going to do? That is essentially a societal issue. It's a conservation issue. Soil conservation. Uh, you all know, or most of you know, uh, we've been operating for decades with farm bills that get passed every five years, or they should get passed every five years. Um, did you know that a significant part of the farm bill that goes back decades is entirely about conservation, soil conservation, for example? Soil conservation is all about making agriculture productive and maintaining an irreplaceable resource. So. Improving agriculture is synonymous with making plants more water efficient, 
preserving the soil, making the, the soil more fertile, which promotes biodiversity, which lessens our dependence on other inputs and so forth. So at the heart of agriculture and agricultural improvement is conservation. Now I hope that doesn't make this conversation so homogeneous and boring. Maybe you can find some points of conflict. <laughs> um, but you know, maybe you can kind of move toward there with your second question or with, with the, the question that you asked. Are there examples where biotechnology uh, could be in conflict with conservation? Mm -hmm. And there certainly are examples where it can, and if not properly managed, will affect issues related to conservation. I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, and these examples represent uh, great successes. They also represent uh, good case studies for management of technology broadly, biotechnology in particular. You all know about BT crops. BT crops are commercialized by several companies, including the one across the street. Great technology because it takes a natural insecticidal protein from a bacterium and it puts it into plants so that you don't have to spray either the BT toxin or uh, by all accounts generally harmful chemicals in the form of pesticides, chemically synthesized pesticides. Uh, very effective. It's in fact in the first 10 years of use of BT cotton and corn uh, we saved Roughly, this, the, uh, roughly 35 million pounds or kilograms of pesticides. So by all measures like that, it's been a great success. It was so successful and has been so successful, it has been overused in some instances. And in cases of overuse, it has the potential to spawn Bt-resistant insects, in particular lepidopteran insects that include things like corn borers and uh, boll worms and things like that. And so this is an example where a great idea in practice it works amazingly well but it can be overused and like the overuse of antibiotics there are potential negative consequences which means the technology has to be managed. Mm -hmm. But so do all of the alternatives. Right, and I think that's the key point, that any technology is a two-edged sword. Nothing is universally good. There's always positive and negative potential consequences. And that's why I think we have to really integrate our societal decision-making to make sure we accommodate all the needs of society now and moving forward. Yeah. And that's what the Nature Conservancy thinks of the future of agriculture is, what we call sustainable intensification. Let me give you one other example of this double-edged sword, and then, then we can move on. Um, the other big implementation of biotechnology in agriculture has been herbicide-resistant plants, again commercialized by the large seed companies. Again, it's biotechnology, it's making the crops resistant to the herbicide so you can kill the weeds without killing your crops, and you can do it without having to go in and use a till to turn the weeds over. That's the traditional way to manage weeds in an agricultural setting, you bury them. Okay, very effective at weed control, but tilling has lots of problems. Over tilling or improper tilling, you know, among other things, caused the erosion of land in the 1930s and 40s. It actually had major effects. The misuse of tilling caused major migration, uh, major economic devastation, hunger, famines in the United States and many other problems. So uh, you can replace tilling with this herbicide GM technology. It's great. You improve soil fertility because you don't have to turn the weeds over. When you turn weeds over with plowing, uh, you create dust, you lose topsoil, you lose biodiversity in the soil, you lose water from the soil, so water retention goes down. Uh, lots of other benefits of not tilling. Great. Two problems that have arisen. One is, like antibiotics, you can overuse it. And so there's the potential for 
herbicide resistant weeds to emerge. So it has to be managed. Another problem, and I'd be interested in Doug's perspective on this, is uh, some of the weeds aren't so bad. <laughs> they're bad if you're a soybean farmer, but they're not so bad if you're a monarch butterfly. If you're a milkweed in particular, the butterflies need the milkweed when they come up from Mexico at the end of their migration. They're essential for the larval stage. That's right. And so Don't sound so surprised. So <laughs> but, but here's the problem. We're very effective now at controlling the weeds in agricultural fields. And in the Midwest, we have a lot of agricultural fields. We have the potential to destroy habitat for the monarch butterflies. And if you phrase it that way, no one would say that's a good idea. I can imagine farmers in Missouri saying, butterfly lovers, I got to grow crops. Well, raise, butterfly raise lovers your hand if you want right to get rid of with, the monarch butterfly. But butterfly lovers would rank right up there with tree huggers. Well, tree <laughs> huggers aren't, aren't so bad usually. No, I understand. But let me, let me turn to Doug with a question that arises when I looked at the Nature Conservancy in Missouri. Everything from, is it Dunn Ranch mm -hmm. up north, uh, where you're introducing bison, I believe. First baby uh, born last week to natural areas down in the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. um, what have you done? Are you doing anything in Nature Conservancy Missouri that directly affects agricultural practice as opposed to preserving highly valued natural areas or bringing back natural areas as in the Grand River grasslands? I, th I think as Jim said, the two go hand in hand. There are <coughs> crown jewels in the Missouri landscape, just as there are anywhere else on Earth, that, that I think are vital to our natural identity, our natural heritage. There are windows of, into what our ancestors saw when they colonized this area. But they'll never be the majority of the landscape. And to sustain, really, the ecological systems we deal with, we have to move that out into the private sector, into the production landscape. So, for instance, at Grand River Grasslands, we own Dunn Ranch, which is a prairie restoration project, but it's embedded in a 70,000 acre landscape of private production lands, mostly cattle ranches, where we're working actively with the cattle producers. Not that we know anything about cattle production, but we're trying to come up with collaborative t solutions that meet conservation needs of those streams, of those grassland birds, of area dependent grassland wildlife, while sustaining an economically vibrant and socially vibrant landscape. And I think that's the future of conservation. We have to recognize that people are embedded in the landscape as Jim said, the, the, the fate of our natural resources depends on agriculture. I would say at the same time we need a recognition that the fate of our societal vibrancy and well-being depends on functional ecosystems. So we have to, again, we're back to my one horse thing of saying we have to integrate those two. But really that's what it means. And the same with croplands where we talk about water runoff into high quality streams or we're trying to work on you know, two-stage ditches and other things that allow better management of cropland resources with no deleterious consequences to the ecosystems they're embedded in. Do you, do you work with agricultural, which is say farming organizations, to get the conservation word out to people engaged in agricultural practice? Yes, we do, around the world. And in fact, at Grand River Grasslands, we have one full-time person whose only job is to work with private ranchers there on conservation practices make them aware of some of the government incentives Jim was talking about, some of the farm bill programs that might help their operation, also benefit conservation, help them work out conservation friendly operation plans. Switch for a minute, a minute from um, pasture and cattle raising to row crops. Uh, thinking about water conservation or irrigation, thinking about the use or overuse of nitrogen fertilizer, think about pesticide, insecticide, spraying, um, all those can have a detrimental effect on the environment, but at least a short-term positive effect on agricultural productivity. How do, you, how do you find the compromise, the common ground, when I want to get my crop out with as high a yield as possible, and never mind 10 or 15 years from now, I may not be farming then. That, that's a key question. I don't have answers to that, but 
you hit on it. I think in many ways we conduct our agriculture today like there is no tomorrow. And we have to think about integrating our agricultural paradigm into a multi-generational concept so our kids and their kids can benefit from agricultural productivity and the natural resources we depend on. I don't have the answers, but that's what the Nature Conservancy feels is key to thinking about how to sustain a healthy planet moving forward for meeting the needs of people and the ecosystem we're dependent on. I, I, I think, Jim, the farming community broadly is at the center of conservation. Now, there's probably some bad farmers out there who don't manage their resources well, and there's some that are really exemplar. But uh, the majority have to manage natural resources, water, for example, and they have to manage costs. So conservation, and this is not a new concept, this is uh, a hundreds year old concept. Conservation and farming go hand in hand. Nowadays, if you apply fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer you mentioned, that was prepared using energy intensive methods. Okay? Natural gas had to be consumed and you are paying for that when you buy nitrogen fertilizer. If you can use less fertilizer and achieve the same result, a farmer is going to do it. Likewise, if you can avoid pesticide sprays, not only is that good for the environment generally, it will save you in costs. If you can preserve your soil through no-till practices, you're going to save on gasoline for your tractor, fertilizer in the future, mm -hmm. and a water bill if you're irrigating. So there are all kinds of examples where, and, it, and this applies to highly mechanized farming these days, row crops, sure. where conservation is at the heart of your operation now and in the future. It's, you know, this gets wrapped up in the bundle called sustainability. I read about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico mm -hmm. uh, that at, I think at least is there at least in part because of the nutrients that have washed down the Mississippi and its tributaries, including fertilizer. Uh, is the dead zone getting smaller because farming is getting cleaner? Yeah, I, I would say, I would push back a little on your point that... Oh, good. We got conflict. I think <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> I think you're right in an ideal world, but I think for the reasons Jim talked about, if you're a farmer and you've got that payment on that $200,000 combine to make, you're going to sacrifice potential long-term benefits for short-term gain. The same with the example you used of BT corn. That could have prevented with best ma been prevented with best management practices of adequate crop rotation and planting non-BT corn as a sacrifice crop, but it didn't happen, and somehow, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, how do we get best management practices suffused to think about the long-term outcome along the way you're talking about? Yeah, you know, there's uh, an, uh, policy and oversight in place to manage those sorts of things. The farmers were supposed to manage refuge. Uh, refuge, in retrospect, was probably not respected particularly well in the early adopters. Right. Okay. Um, so I don't, have a, I don't have a defense for mismanagement or operating off the label. And in fact, the label prescribes practices that include refuge. Um, yeah, so short-term gains, you know, I don't have any answer for uh, turning a buck quickly at the cost of the environment. That's... Uh, we, we could get into regulations and we could get into responsibility, uh, but I'm not sure I, I, think I have an awful lot to add there. I think it has to extend to, and, and there's the, the nascent movement of this, of a societal groundswell to really think about sustainability, as you say, sustainability and what it means in all its vectors for us as a people, and looking beyond the people in this room to our kids and our grandchildren and making sure they have those resources. I don't know how we suffuse that through society either, but that's really what it's going to take to, to balance and bring those best management practices into play. Well, and, and listening to this conversation makes me wonder a little bit whether 
conservation is at the heart of agriculture or whether agriculture and conservation are sort of either in a standoff or in conflict with one another. That many of the conservation organizations I read about or I indeed belong to um, focus on preserving natural resources, but they don't talk much about agriculture. I can pick up the the Sierra, or I can pick up the Nature Conservancy magazine, or I can pick up something from the Natural Resources Defense Council or from the EDF, Environmental Defense Fund. And I don't see much in those about agriculture, about farming practices, about how we use so much of our land. Uh, I would say in the last two years, you've seen more in the Nature Conservancy, but your, your thesis is correct. But I, I just read a piece in the Huffington Post from the CEO of the Nature Conservancy, mm -hmm. talking about this intersection of agriculture and conservation. Uh, and he listed a number of initiatives, some of which uh, involve many companies that we know about, institutions, nonprofits, organizations like the Nature Conservancy. I think there's pretty broad recognition, actually, from my perspective, from certainly mainstream well, well, let me Let me come at my question in a somewhat different way. I was looking at the Nature Conservancy website this afternoon, um, and it said that the Nature Conservancy addresses the most urgent conservative needs, conservation needs. Um, what are those, the most urgent conservation needs? Um, do they focus at all in agricultural sustainability and enhanced productivity? Or are the most urgent conservation needs focused on preserving wetlands or restoring the grasslands or um, preserving a mountain range or cleaning up a, a well-known creek? All of the above. I, th I think your, your point is correct that it's only recently that the conservation community has understood, we've, we've been fairly naive about this, that the fate of conservation is held by agriculture. In Missouri, two-thirds of the Missouri landscape is in non-forest production land. Two-thirds of the every square inch of this state, and most of the rest of it is Ozark Forest. So the, the fate of conservation is held by the fate of agriculture. And I think that's, there's you growing think awareness of you that. You think agriculturalists recognize or know that? No. They think feeding the public right. is... I think it's right now there's, there's an asymmetry there. Yeah. that we know that the fate of conservation is controlled by agriculture. I would say there's a lower level of recognition, particularly among the producers, that the fate of healthy agricultural systems is ultimately dependent on healthy ecosystem functions, mm -hmm. providing the water and, and soil integrity and everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. there's been progress, so I'm optimistic. And if you're not optimistic, we're doomed as a society. So can, can let's all be optimistic. Can I ask Doug a question? Sure. What, I over the past 10 years, have you seen, in this two-thirds of the state that's under cultivation, have you seen progress toward more sustainable practices? Just throw it, come back to no-till or low-till farming. Has, have you seen a noticeable effect across the state? I think, there, yeah, there's been progress. It's been uneven depending on the area. No-till is probably one of the success stories. I think agriculture is still not managing water and fertilizer as well as we need to to be healthy and, and, and efficient. And the Conservancy thinks that the prongs for meeting people's food needs and meeting ecosystem needs rest on better water use, as you said, better fertilizer use and control of deleterious effects of both of those, S more sophisticated intensification, including biotechnology on the lands that are arable, mm -hmm. and making sure that our, our high production lands are deployed appropriately for the ecosystems and preventing spoilage through infrastructure and transport. Mm. Yeah. That's what we see as the role where conservation can help to inform the discussion of this sustainable intensification of agriculture. Mm. I think earlier on, uh, Jim, you had a good point when you talked about the cost of production, because if in fact there is more low-till or minimum tillage agriculture, at least in part, I'd blame that on the price of gasoline or the price of diesel. Uh, it's expensive to haul that harrow and that disc and that plow back and forth. And if you can do it less, do it less. Mm 
intuitively, that, that, uh, intuitively I agree with you. Um, I think in practice, a few additional factors come into play. One, and the reason I asked Doug about what, what he's <coughs> witnessed on the farm as far as adoption of more sustainable practices is uh, just that, adoption. If you have a system on your farm, especially if you're managing thousands of acres and you're used to tilling, going to no-till is not an easy thing. That's, that's something that requires a lot of work, practice, new technology, failures perhaps, learning how to do it, and learning how to adopt it in an economical way on a large scale. So for all of these things, transitioning to different irrigation practices, implementing um, precision agriculture, for example, where uh, you don't uh, just turn the spigot on for X number of hours on a particular patch of land because that's what you think you need. You turn it on when you really do need it, where you really need it, based on empirical data that you're measuring with high technology. And maybe that involves simple probes, maybe it involves GPS, maybe it involves lots of different things. But these are, uh, all of these technology humps require changing of practices, which is as big of a barrier, I think, to um, it, it, it's a barrier oh, sure. to see those intuitive cost savings that you're suggesting. And the people who make machinery, the people who make fertilizer, the people who make pesticide are in the business of selling it. Just like the people who make antibiotics are in the it's business of selling. It's not like any other industry where innovation can come into play. You have disruptive technology. Sure. Um, we host this two-day conference called the Ag Innovation Showcase in the fall. And the reason that we host it is because we think there are lots of good emerging companies out there that need a spotlight shined on them that are bringing new and novel technology to the marketplace. So the future belongs to the innovators. And uh, you, know, you know, it used to be said that they would never bring phones to rural Africa because it cost too much to string phone lines. Uh, they didn't bring landlines. Well, that's my point. It, because it was too expensive and people were too dispersed for yeah. phones. They'll never get them until cell phones were invented. Yeah, bingo. And you didn't need landlines. So the future belongs to the disruptors. Sure, sure. And the innovators. Let me switch now to questions from the audience. We've been going at each other long enough. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we've had enough conflict no, we yet. Haven't. What research projects at the Danforth Center are being directed at alleviating the problems discussed? Water, pesticides, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, well, again, let me come back to my core thesis, and that is that the future of productive agriculture is essentially a series of conservation questions. How can we produce more? Because we'll have more people that have needs, and those people will be eating different things, more meat, which requires much more productivity. Uh, so all of our research is directed at addressing that grand challenge. Another big grand challenge is how do we produce energy in more intelligent, sustainable ways uh, in the future. Uh, so some of the projects that we're working on here involve understanding how plants utilize water. And what we do is we study variants or varieties of plants, sometimes mutants, that have a better or worse water use efficiency. And then we try to figure out what's the difference between a plant that uses water really well and those plants that require a lot of water. Same thing with fertilizer. We have programs looking at nutrient uptake and then what plants do with those nutrients once they're taken up. Uh, we also have programs looking for alternatives to conventional uh, pest and disease control strategies. So again, the rationale there is to develop uh, using genetics, in many cases, conventional genetics through breeding, in other cases, biotechnology, to control diseases and pests so that you don't have to add the pesticides. Those are some broad categories of examples that mm -hmm. are going on in several laboratories around the Danforth Center. 
some specific questions about the research here. What kinds of studies is the Danforth Plant Science Center doing on soil health? Any research on carbon in soil? Does nutrient depleted soil grow nutrient depleted food? <laughs> okay, a lot of questions there. Yeah. Um, we do have some projects that have a focus, primary focus on the soil. And that is, uh, as I mentioned, for understanding nutrient uptake and understanding what plants do with the nutrients like iron, molybdenum, and things like that that are extracted from this soup that we call soil. Um, soil is really interesting and we know almost nothing about it. We know a lot of descriptive stuff about soil, um, but there's a whole lot of functionality with soil that we don't understand. I would like to see more programs focused on soil. Give you an example of what's really interesting these days and where when you go out to the prairie, the grassland prairie environments, it gets really fascinating. The diversity of organisms in the soil is absolutely staggering. It's the most diverse environment on the planet. Would you agree or disagree? Certainly in, the, in our world it is, yes. The numbers of bacteria in a uh, gram of soil in an average ordinary soil is about 100 million cells. So there's 100 million organisms and that's just the bacteria in a typical gram of soil. Soil is a soup of organic material that is living, breathing. It's got fungi, it's got worms, nematodes, in addition to the bacteria. And a fascinating area of research is what all those microbes are doing to promote plant growth or to suppress diseases. And we know they're doing both. Another really interesting little factoid, I like to try to find a factoid to give you uh, because maybe you won't remember anything, but maybe you'll remember this. Of all the carbon that comes into plants from the environment, from CO2, you know, plants are the big capturers of CO2 and they turn CO2 into important organic molecules they need to survive. 30% of the carbon that comes from the atmosphere into the plants gets spit back out into the soil. Did you know that? Yeah. And that's oh, you know that? That's one of the issues oh. with our I ag just soils. Learned, I just learned that last week. We have to, that, that carbon is essential for healthy ag soils, yeah. and those tillage practices you talk about blow it back out into the atmosphere. Exactly. So if you think about that, 30% of the carbon that's fixed, and there's an awful lot of carbon that's captured for plants to grow, 30% of that goes back out the back end into the soil and who uses it in the soil? It's the microbes. And uh, secondarily, uh, the things eating the microbes or that depend on the microbes. And that's nature at its finest and at its most basic. Uh, go out to the prairies, the natural prairies, the restored or the undisturbed prairies, and you'll see magnificent biodiversity in and around the soil. So understanding how nature does it will help us manage our soil resources better. That's the reason that we need to increase the amount of activity in that area, and I have to admit, it's relatively low, but not, not non-existent. Well, this is a question that's a good follow-on for that. Would increased funding for ag res agricultural research help, government or private? And I think asking any researcher whether more money would help is a self-answering <laughs> question. Um, the answer is no, money by itself won't solve the problem, but money sent to the Danforth Center will. <laughs> <laughs> and the Nature Conservancy. <laughs> I, I think just building on that, for the very reasons you talked about previously, we are still woefully ignorant as a society about all the natural world that formed these rich soils that made us the breadbasket of the world. So there is a compelling need for research from both an agricultural and an ecosystem perspective. We, we haven't figured it out yet, and it's going to be an ongoing process like building a cathedral to get to that. And here's a, a very detailed one that I think is interesting. What about the possibility of devising genetically modified weeds? I would have thought they were healthy enough, but anyway. 
that are more compatible with agricultural crops and yet outcompete harmful weeds. For example, consider developing nitrogen fixing clover that can be planted along with corn and can outcompete most of the weeds that compete with corn. Yeah, that it, it, in that specific example, if that in that hypothetical example, the clover would not be considered a weed. The clover would be considered part of a critical uh, rotation or a crop cover. So you would turn that weed into a part of the crop system in that case. Um, but uh, the idea of taking weeds, which are defined, weeds have a definition as being unwanted. Um, that doesn't mean all <laughs> plants that aren't crops are weeds, but there, there's a definition that the weed scientists use. Um, I think the idea of trying to outsmart the weeds uh, is <laughs> maybe not a good idea. I wouldn't go there, <laughs> and I wouldn't particularly suggest anyone go there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time with that one. I think the weeds are, they seem to do perfectly well in my yard with absolutely no help. <laughs> How can we develop crops that meet the farmer's production goals and still support the native biomass that supports the ecosystem? You want me to go over that once more? Because it's, I think, a good question for you, Doug. Yeah, I, I think my sense is we're not trying to develop crops that are necessarily compatible with the ecosystem on that piece of ground. We're trying to develop the most effective crops to sustain human food needs and intensively apply them in the areas that are, are not irreversibly deleterious to sustaining the ecosystems in which our ag activities are embedded. So from my perspective, at least, I think less about crop suitability for natural areas, say, or, or ecosystem function as how do we deploy them and where and how do we use the water and fertilizer and make sure that there's no deleterious externalities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To that end, I think we, as, as Jim said, we have to intensify on those areas that are appropriate for production agriculture, we have to intensify to the maximum extent possible productivity to meet human food, food needs and also sustain intact natural habitats. Yeah. No, another part of that, and maybe a slightly different way to, to phrase it, would have to do with can we make agriculture carbon and greenhouse gas neutral? Mm -hmm. That's maybe a different way of phrasing the question. Um, and that's certainly uh, working toward that as a goal is a good thing. Um, the question is how far can we get? There are certain things that we know work. No-till agriculture, we keep coming back to that one. Um, uh, but we have a long ways to go. Here's w we have two on virtually the same topic. It's one you raised early on, Jim. Does nothing restore the Ogallala aquifer, uh, aquifer? What happens when it's fully depleted? And the second question, how long will the Ogallala aquifer last under present practice? What can be changed? That's a question for Doug. Because <laughs> maybe, maybe, I actually don't know what the, at the current rate of depletion, how much longer the Ogallala aquifer has to go. But maybe there's... Is the rate of, do you know, I have no idea, is the rate of depletion growing or are we depleting it more slowly as we become aware of the risks. At the moment, the rate of depletion is growing, but there's an interstate working group, as you said, it spans a huge area, meeting for that very purpose to, and thinking about drawdown rates, major uses, and how do we regulate it to make sure that that extremely slow infiltration rate is sustainable. Uh, we're not there yet. It's still being depleted unsustainably, but people are thinking about it on a broad scale that needs to be thought about. Well, let me ask th this last question again. What happens when it's fully depleted? You get thirsty. Well, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have a crash in both productivity and ecological health of that region, and you, you may have another dust bowl, or you'll certainly see a huge diminishment of agricultural productivity. Does that I don't think we can risk contemplating that. Does the interstate group have a timeline? I don't, I'm not familiar enough to know. <laughs>
So wh sure. what I imagine on the agricultural scene is you would revert back to what you all saw in the 1970s when you flew over Nebraska and eastern Colorado. Uh, you, would, you would see what you saw back then, mm -hmm. which was okay. a lot of brown in the dry parts of the year and maybe some uh, dry land farming, maybe, maybe some alfalfa, I don't know, grassland, whatever. But you would see dry land farming come back and you would see fewer green circles when you look out the window of the airplane. You have all noticed the uh, meteoric rise over the past 30 years of those green circles. Where you see a green circle, they're almost certainly drawing water up from underground. And uh, again, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, this is where they are. So you would lose that farming, which would uh, since that yields, you know, something on the order of uh, uh, maybe somebody knows the exact number, 30%, 40, 35% of the productivity in the U.S. on an overall uh, level, this would have major ramifications for us. Yes. I'm told we have time for one more question, so I will exert my executive authority. Much good is being done by plant science. But is there any downside? For instance, I hear that what has become so refined that it's affected many people negatively, i.e. gluten-free necessity. Thank you. But is there any downside to plant science? For instance, I hear that what has become so refined that it's affected many people negatively. Um, I could guess what the question, if the question's referring to uh, refined foods mm -hmm. and the proliferation of processed foods uh, and the way we're delivering calories to citizens of the United States, that's a big problem. Um, I'm not sure that's an agricultural problem primarily, but certainly because a lot of corn and soybean goes into processed foods, um, it has, you know, you, 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 can, you can trace that problem back to crop commodities, I mm -hmm. suppose. I think the, the issue is not agriculture per se, it's, it's what we're doing to, the to feed our population. That it's, food pro it's a food processing issue more than a plant science issue, I should think. We don't, uh, we don't respect broccoli and Brussels sprouts quite the way we do um, tons of refined corn syrup on the commodity market. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't even know it's broccoli. A, isn't that a, isn't that a very different issue, Jim? I didn't even know broccoli was on the commodity market. <laughs> I, I know it's on my Bro plate about three nights a week, but anyway. <laughs> I think we've come to the end of the questions. I am delighted again with the audience, and I think this has been an informative and surely provocative conversation, uh, a conversation about conservation. Whoever came up with that tongue twister was inspired. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all, thank and you. thank you. Thanks very much, and uh, let's give the two panelists and our Intrepid moderator, another hand, and thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>